a class and it was really interesting because the, the, he was telling the, the students what his, uh, t his process was in, in giving good grades. Like if you want an A, what you have to do. And he's talking about you, you need to analyze the material. You need accurate perception. I want a point of view. I want ambiguity. And he says, if you want an A plus, give me two ambiguities. And I thought that was fascinating. Ambiguity is sort of like a contradiction. Um, and going to another level. And so I'm interested in, and in, in, in some of the things that he's interested in, he was talking about creating a place where we can coexist. He says, that's what a thing is. When you have a thing for somebody, it's, it's sort of this idea that you, you want a place where the, where the two of you can coexist. So with that as a sort of a setup, also, I think Doug, uh, we were talking earlier about, um, I forgot what the context was, but uh, you, you quoted the Red Queen uh, giving a command to Alice that she should think of six impossible things before breakfast. <laughs> That's sort of where this exercise is coming from. Can you all hear me by the way? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so, Let's start with this exercise, and then I think we could just go right into what, what, whatever is triggered for you in this particular episode with John Horgan and Stuart Kaufman. And then maybe we could do a little a personal check-in at the end of our call today, because I thought you usually do it at the beginning, but maybe we could do it at the end, because um, I would just uh, be curious about how that might be different. Um, so if you look at what, so this is basically the, the it's a couple of steps, it's a procedure. You're, be, you're gonna be working mostly with the visual and the kinesthetic. So I want you, and I wish, uh, actually, I guess he's not gonna be here today. It's too bad because he's, he's always into touch. So I think that the touch is really uh, focused on a lot in this, in this exercise. And I get it from Nora Bateson. Um, she didn't do this exercise, but she talked about the, the qualities of our imagination, which is potential, possible, and, and the actual. So it's the, what happens between the possible and the actual, that I believe is the, the focus of, of Stuart Kaufman and John Horgan in this, in this essay. So anyway, without more ado, look at your, Look for an object on your desk or in front of you. Don't touch it. Just look at it. Okay. And can you, by, by the way, can you all unmute yourselves? I just want to, yeah. So I want you to look at the object and imagine what that object will feel like. Oh, we're recording now? We're, okay. Yes. Yeah. So imagine what that object will feel like when you touch it. And when you're ready, touch it. And notice the difference between the actual touch and the imagined touch. How is it different? And when you've noted that, noted that difference, what kind of a difference is that? Does that difference have a size or a shape? What are the qualities of that difference between the imagined touch and the actual? And when you're ready, just nod your head. Let me know you've completed that. Now, look for another object. We're going to do the same thing with another object. So choose an object. Imagine what it will feel like if you touched it. 
Now actually touch the object. Be aware of the difference between the imagined touch and the actual touch. Now I would like you to, the memory of the first object, the experience of that first object, and the experience of the second object, is there a relationship? And if so, what kind of relationship is that relationship between the experience of the first object and the second object? And so I would invite you if you learned anything from this experience, maybe you didn't, but if you did or made any observations, I would love to hear that. Maybe we could do a little debriefing about what that was like for you. I can go first. Sure. It's all right with everyone, but. My, my two objects are this water bottle here and folded up paper towel. Um, would you like me only to describe the relationship between the two or the whole process? Well, what, however way you want to describe it in a way that makes sense to you. So the water bottle, I know, or knew it would be cool to the touch. I imagined it as solid, even though there's liquid inside, I knew it would not crumble or I wouldn't squeeze right into it. So those were the two main touch aspects that I, I uh, imagined. But when I touched it, I was, I felt heat uh, and it was a lot softer than I expected, just because of the pads of my finger. Um, and the heat reminded me of, I, I still take cold showers and the washcloth will start out cool, but as you go on your body, it, it warms up or you feel the heat um, from your body going on to the washcloth, which is kind of strange. But So that's what it reminded me of. And then this napkin I got from a, a bathroom today after washing my hands. I've made my my good deed of the day by saving these because they're clean. I, I use soap and I like to save paper towels and paper. Um, but at the time I remember it being soft. Um, but I had it in my back pocket and I pulled it out earlier just because I empty out my pockets uh, whenever I'm uh, going to be standing or sitting for a long time. And when I reached out to touch this soft kind of flaky paper towel, it ended up being firm and crisp uh, just because I guess the water had dried. And so that was another unexpected. So the relationship is these unexpected things that I would normally probably not notice, but now that I owned my, or focused my attention on these two objects, there's a different reality to them, I suppose. Great. So there's a different reality and unexpected things between these two objects and the imagined and the actual. Thank you. Marco or Ed, is there anything you'd like to share about this exercise? Sure. The first object I saw is my my water bottle I take on my bike. And it's, ever since I have it, it's always been kind of fascinating to me because it's supposed to be made of some kind of environmentally friendly plastic, whatever the hell that is. And then uh, what's odd about it is, it is it looks very solid, but it feels almost rubbery sometimes to the touch. But it's, and I, and I know that, and I've always been fascinated because it just, it feels kind of weird. But 
uh, this time it just it felt slicker than usual. It's smoother than usual. That was the the first one. And the second thing that I had that I I pulled up was my wife's my wife's passport, which was on my desk because I had to get her ESTA for our upcoming trip. And it's it it has kind of a rough surface to it. I mean, it's it's something that doesn't like slide easily in your hand. Uh, but when I picked it up, um, I expecting that roughness. It was it was slick like the bottle. It felt very smooth, and that that was the relationship between them. That, that somehow this slickness kind of like carried over when when I felt against it. Now now that I'm talking about it. And, and rubbing the passport like I was just rubbing it, it's, it's like I expected it to be. It's very rough and, you know, you can kind of you know, move the covers back and forth and things. But before it was, it was slick like that. So that was the, there was a certain unexpected, yeah, don't get those mail order. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was a certain unexpectedness in both cases. I guess we do. Thank Clear. you. That's great. Marco, would you like to share anything about your experience of those two objects? I'll try. Um, well, first, there's a virtual um, kind of projecting of an experience that I did when you in instructed us to imagine touching the objects and so in a way like part of me the imagination is is actually kind of moving a, a subtle body it's moving a sort of volitional kind of body and uh so i have the object here is a mug with some uh little bit of kombucha in it that i haven't finished the other object was this book here because over the weekend i was reviewing gebser's writings on the archaic structure of consciousness and what i think i noted about the difference between my virtual touching which i practice in meditation like i've started noting where i have tensions in my body or almost giving myself massages not physically but by putting attention in a soothing way uh, that eases the tent the knot or whatever may be um stuck and uh, the, what I found is that the actually physically touching the objects confirmed my, my initial uh, projection of a feeling of what it would be like, hard, cool, slightly rough, uh, solid. Uh, I, I imagined opening the pages and, and feeling the, the pages and running my hands down and the words and how there's a very, very slight little bump from the ink on a page. And uh, what I found is that I enjoyed the physical touch because I could like flip the pages and actually feel and change the differential in pressure, how much pressure I apply. So I, f I think the pleasure of, the, 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 of touch is, uh, is partly maybe stronger, a little more intense with the physical and with the virtual, there's a little more work involved in um, making it happen. Thank you. This is fascinating to me. Um, as we're um, looking at um, paranormal experiences, um, telepathy and tragedy is the title of this chapter. And, and I'm thinking about the difference between premonition and telepathy remote viewing, near death, or near life experience, clairvoyance, clairaudience, um, PK, psychokinesis, synchronicity. I'm reading a, an interesting theorist, Stephen Browdy. He's a, he studies the paranormal. He, he's claiming that synchronicity is a form of psychokinesis. I think that's a very interesting idea. So he's, he's, he's upsetting the apple cart in terms of uh, what Jung thinks, uh, an a-causal connecting principle, um, because Browdy thinks that there is a cause and it's the human mind, these synchronistic events, and it's a form of PK. So anyway, 
So I'm just calling all, I'm just trying to find what all these weird experiences have in common. And I would think, you know, a good label would be this, it's psychic. So I'm curious when psychic, and I'm, I'm inviting you to come up with a metaphor here. If you don't, that's okay too. You could just come up with some qualities. And I know you all are psychic, or you probably would not be alive. <laughs> some of you have reported some of this, like Ed talked about his uh, experience last time at that, uh, that green light, and he heard that voice. And um, so when psychic, That's psychic like what? So if something comes to you, you would like to share, I'd love to hear it. Does anyone have anything? I have a ton of things. I'm a little bit wary of opening up cans of worms, but... Let's start with insects. <laughs> this is very, this is just very minor. This is just a very minor example, but it occurred to me just the other day and I noted it and, uh, and then it came up, it recurred in a different context. So it's almost like multiple contexts became interlinked. And I'm also aware that one context, one perspective on this experience is like, just to discount it. And that there's something perhaps true to that as well, I want to note. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, uh, there was um, these, uh, these um, I guess, books that they were trying to sell. Uh, it was Time Life books. You remember Time Life books? Yeah. They had editions on UFOs. They had editions on uh, all kinds of topics, uh, beautiful pictures, writing, etc. But uh, the question was always, is it a coincidence or is there something more, more to it? And uh, the presumption is it's a coincidence. That's like the default state uh, assumption about, about this. So I'm aware of that. And I think there may be something to that too. However, so um, I had received a text message from a friend who uh, has, uh, is, a, is a musician, has sent me some music in the past and we've published a couple of his songs on, on metapsychosis. And the piece appeared to be just recorded on his phone. Some evening, it sounded like he was sitting outside, maybe with a, his wife or kids or something or, or, or someone else. And there were cicadas. And so he was recording the cicadas and it was that drone sound that they make in the, in the summertime, especially when they get loud and they get repetitive. And they, they're, they're going zoom, 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 zoom. And you can forget that they're there because they are so ubiquitous and so immersive that they form a kind of soundscape, like in the trees around you and everything. And so he recorded that and then playing some music and singing some lyrics. The lyrics, the name of the song was In the Middle. And I couldn't tell you the lyrics. They were kind of, I couldn't capture them all. I listened to it a few times. But I, I wanted to respond to him in some way, and I didn't have a response. So I just let it sit in space. And then a couple days later, Sunday afternoon, uh, I had the day mostly to myself. Uh, Kayla and the girls were on an expedition, and I had the pleasure and luxury to be able to sit out in my backyard in a lounge chair under some trees, in the middle of the afternoon reading. And I was reading a, another, piece, another um, piece for metapsychosis. This was from Brian George. The title of the piece uh, is Transparency is Our Only Shield Against Disaster. Okay, so I'm reading this because uh, he suggested we might publish it in metapsychosis and I wanted to review it and I'm going through and making my notes and underlining lines that are interesting to me and this whole time, there's a subliminal awareness that of the cicadas around me. Uh, and 
I note them. I think I just note them very peripherally, but I know that they're there because I'm, I'm noticing the things around me as I'm reading. And I enjoy sitting in my yard because we have a couple of trees. It's a very sm small and narrow lot, but there's enough wildlife to keep me entertained. Butterflies and beetles and uh, bees and hawks that will circle high above and crows, um, sparrows, jays, tree. They're all, they're all around. I'm, I'm noting them. It's very pleasurable to read in that kind of context. Uh, so I'm going through and I come to a line and I don't have the paper with me right now, but the word is hyperspace. What Brian says in the piece is that what we consider to be space is m more hyperspace. It's more, that's the real reality of space. As I underline that line and I circle it, because I'm noting it, it's like I had a little shift in perception, a little like micro Satori, suddenly the cicadas stop. I mean, all at once, quiet. And I heard suddenly, the, I heard the breeze come through and a fly came right around my head and a little moth kind of fluttered this way. And still the silence of the cicadas. And I looked up and I noted the clouds and the wind and that's all. I, I, I noted that. Uh, I didn't know quite what to make of it. It was stunning, actually. Uh, not overwhelmingly stunning, just curious, like enough to make me pause and really to appreciate it because it was kind of beautiful. It was really wonderful how the sudden silence allowed these other qualities to, to um, manifest and how it seemed to be timed really precisely with that word hyperspace. So later that day or the next day, I was sitting and just letting things come through. And I wrote, I, I replied to my friend, uh, Paul, with a little anecdote in a text message. It was just a few lines, but it was my response essentially to his offering of the song uh, in the middle. And in the middle is an interesting title, which maybe is another branching, uh, but there's a lot of ways we could, I guess, um, interpret that. And so, I think the constellation of experiences around that aesthetic um, interaction, that aesthetic relationship is um, I think part of what I would associate with psychic, a sort of psychic poetics perhaps. Um, and I think that's all I'll share about that. That's just a little bit of ex an experience. And I, I, yeah, I, I think it's a, a little portal into others as well that, that I would love to explore further. And, and psychic poetics and mm -hmm. constellations and silence of the cicadas. Mm. I like that. Yeah. yeah. That's, a ni that's a title to something. I don't right? know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for taking us on that, that journey with your subtle subtle and not so subtle bodies thank you yeah and and doug and or ed if there's anything when psychic what, did, what was the original question that's like what when psychic that's like what if you have something that'd be great would you like to go ed i i'm drawing a blank i have a very surface level reading of myself right now so. <laughs> the, the only the only word that comes to mind and there's not there's not a lot of images not a lot of pictures but the only the only thing that comes to mind is reassuring um anytime i have these experiences it's re to me it's re i feel reassured um, when i hear the little voice i know i need to listen it's just you know um that little voice has never let me down uh, and i can i can always rely on it um got me through the got me through when you go to the military, the first thing anybody tells you, especially anyone who's ever been there, is never volunteer. N never raise your hand. Never say, I'll do that. And I can't tell you how many times that little voice said, go ahead and raise your hand. And every time I did, I had, I got, I avoided not like a lot of physical pain, but there's a lot of mental pain that goes on in the, the military. I remember we were in, uh, in Arizona. And they ask if anybody had uh, carpentry experience, which I've nailed two boards together. I, I wouldn't consider myself a carpenter, but to me that, 
And I'm, I'm like, oh, should I do that? Because I don't know. And the voice is good. Just say, yeah. And so I said, yes. And I got put on this detail that uh, we had to put paneling up in, um, in the activity rooms. This is, this is in uh, Sierra Vista, down Fort Huachuca, Fort Huachuca in Arizona. And it's, it's hot during the day down there. Freezes at night. It would like snow in the morning and it would be 85 degrees in the afternoon and um, kind of thing. So you, there was a lot of air conditioning. And the only way that you could tell that there were paths between the buildings, these were all built, uh, they were wood frame structures built in World War II when they threw the base up and they just kind of let them there. And the only way that you could tell that there was a path because it's a difference between the dirt that's been raked and it usually has stones lined up to the show. Oh, it looks like a walkway. And since it's dusty there all those th the time, those stones have to be painted. So one of the things that people got to do was to paint stones white so that they could make these lines. Well, sitting out in a hot sun painting stones is not my idea of a good time. Um, putting up wood paneling isn't my idea of a good time, but the activity rooms were all air conditioned. So we were working, <laughs> we're working in an air conditioned room and everybody else is out there is raking dirt and painting stones. That's, it's that kind of thing. So that's, that's where that reassurance comes. Or um, if I, I know that if I ask a question hard enough, which is not the right word, but intense enough, and then just let it go, the answer will show up. I, 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 I just know that it comes. It comes in odd ways. I, I think I've mentioned once or twice, I've been in bookstores where books literally leaped off the shelf. And, and and you could pick it up in the page and on that page somewhere, I always look to see, well, okay, well, where did it open up? Somebody's trying to tell me something. Um, you could find either an answer or a clue to look further. And there was either a pointer or, or the answer in there. And so, and that, that's why this reassuring, I always know something comes of it in the end. Um, most of the, the, the experiences I've had have all been positive, just like the green light. I, I, I love the question, what happens if a red light? And I'll tell you right now, if it said go through the red light, I, I wouldn't hesitate at all. I'd just go. Whether my brother drives like that or not, Doug, thanks for the, uh, for the clip. <laughs> so, uh, because I, just, I trust that. So there's that, that reassurance, an element of trust is in there. There's, um, there's uh, the, it's one, of the, it's one of those few instances in my life where I feel certain about something. You know, there's certainty involved. That's uh, perhaps another way uh, that goes into that. But, that. but those are the things I associate with that, what, what you're designating as psyche, which is as good a word as any, I would say. That, that's great. And you're, it's great because you're, you're, you're modeling yourself. You're, you're sharing your own, your own process in a very adept way. I'm very curious though about that little voice and your in trust and gives you a sense of certainty. And that little voice, how little is that little voice? It's little in the sense of it, it's never loud. It's and whereabouts, is it on the inside or the outside? Um, both, Some, sometimes it's inside, sometimes it's outside. Um, the green light uh, thing, it was outside. I, I do know that in the military, it was always, I, I, I guess in the military, it was just hiding out like I was trying to do. <laughs> so it, it was usually inside. Um, uh, very often, very often it comes from the, like the right. If you, if you look down on, at the, my body, the, the, the rear right quadrant kind of going out there in the, the aura egg or whatever that's that's a lot of places you know it's i don't want to go to that there's some you know it's not like there's a devil sitting on my one shoulder and a you know, and, the, and an angel on the other or anything like that uh but it, a lot of times it's coming from from back here and, and it's the rear right quadrant yeah, what would be behind my right ear you know what is that lobe part of the, the brain and, the and, and one more question if you, if you don't mind yeah. Oh. This may be very naive, but how old is that little voice in that right quadrant when trust and certainty? Does it have an age? No. No, no. I, I've never thought of it. It's not, 
it's not, it's not high, it's not childlike, it's not deep, it's no basso, it's just, it's just this, it's just this kind of soft voice. Thank you. No, go ahead. Put your hand up. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Doug, have you made sense of your experience or you're making a drawing or whatever? No, I'm standing here um, going through my life story, it sounds like. Uh, so I'll, I think it comes down to a certain relationship, um, not necessarily with the psychic, but with I think I'd call them, they're more than spaces, that, but I don't know if realms or dimensions are the right term. Um, so when, when this psychic arrives or there's a tuning into it um, or a receiving, um, then the relationship can continue. So that there needs to be some connective tissue for lack of a better word, but this, this relationship involves being connected in some form. And, and the relationship in it's an alternate reality or another part of reality in which for someone, if I'm getting personal here, for someone like me as a single unit, it's easy for me to allow that to be my go-to reality perhaps. So work, life, family, um, I could say, or at least in the past, it was a lot easier for me to say, this reality sounds good to me, I'll, I'll stick there. Um, now that I have a bit more grounding, um, I'm learning, learning when and how to access this relationship with the other reality. Uh, and. and with the relationships that have formed on, on infinite conversations with all of you here. Uh, there's just, just as the program thinking aloud, uh, it, I, I really like the term thinking aloud, uh, that that's what we allow each other to do here. And it's not like a self-help group or, Oh, great. You did this Johnny, uh, type of thing. It's, we can go on explorations and sure I can talk to this about, uh, talk about my experiences with my loved ones, but um, there's, there's that shift in reality that occurs here or that occurs and we bring it here and we're allowed to think about these things without um, being shut down. So I've been exploring quite a bit more recently, um, dream work, uh, body work, um, Robert Bruce, who I'm, I'm not um, a big fan of, but I, I really like some of his exercises of energy work because it, it works, <laughs> whether you believe in um, everything he says or it, that doesn't matter. That's something we can perhaps discuss here as well. But um, it, it's, it is real, these subtle bodies, uh, these energies within. Um, it's just a matter of how deep you'd like to go, I, I guess. Thank you, Doug, and um, and a bit in these in the alternate reality, and a bit more grounding in when and how access to other reality, and when grounded, and when and how access other reality. Then what happens? So the, I think the grounding is crucial because it, it's easy to be a, a wiggly bottle rocket and never come back and you'll fizzle out, but you, you need some sort of ground control to tap back into um, so you can go on mission after mission. And ground control. 
thank you very much. And um, I, I really ha have enjoyed uh, this sharing because I, I think that as we, um, I think it's great to get rapport at those metaphorical levels. Um, Cause we can of course share, you know, personal anecdotes and everything, but I think there's something about making that uh, transparent as possible. And if not a metaphor, it, it, there's, uh, you know, qualities. And um, our perceptual acuity, I think, starts to kick in and there's a better flow between concepts and abstractions and the perceptual spaces we find ourselves in. So I think this is very galvanizing and I believe we learn a lot more about ourselves as a group. So this is great adventure. I am psychic. When psychic, it's like I'm like an overtone singer. And it's like overtone singing. And when I'm overtone singing, it's holding a shape. There's a size and a shape to the oral cavity, to the, to the chest, to the lungs. And there's an, a, a capacity to hold ambiguous shapes. So I so, oh. It's a kind. Of, it's very subtle, but there's a there's a tone, and there's a above the tone, and there's an undertone, and you can sort of embrace that ambiguity, which of course in regular singing is is something that you would avoid. You would want to hit the note. Um, so about this uh, tragedy and telepathy. If we wanted to move into the to the essay and to that interview, I would be really curious about your responses to it. Um, I think my, initially when I when I looked at this, I'm familiar with Stuart Kaufman. I think he's great, a uh, really interesting guy writing about um, systems theory. I had no idea he had this tragic experience, um, and I think that it was interesting that he came came forward after his wife's death and many years after the death of his daughter and uh, explored this, opened this can of worms and his search for a, some kind of theory, uh, I think is really interesting. Um, I think it's a good preparation for the next event we have scheduled in the cafe, which is uh, Jeffrey is going to be looking at um, the quantum, quantum and, and, so, and the so social worlds, quantum mind and the social worlds. Um, because I think this is extremely, really challenging material. And so I thought it would be great for us to have a, you know, a, a head start and just uh, work on something. I think that's a little chunking it down and it's a little more manageable um, with this John Horgan uh, interview. So any inspirations or interests or curiosity or objections to this essay uh, and this interview, I, I would be really open to starting an open, open discussion. Thanks. I, I really enjoyed the chapter and I enjoyed the, the interview. Um, you had shown a Horgan interview once, once before I listened to and, and it was okay. It, I, think, I think interviewing is a, is a, is a, a tr it's an art. There's some people that can interview and some people that can't. Horgan, Horgan manages relatively well. He's had a lot of experience at it. He's getting better at it too as he goes along. I, I, I kind of get the feel of that. But what struck me about Kaufman more than anything else is it's so hard for him to gear it down for normal mortal human beings. <laughs> you know, this is like, it's like he's, he, I, I love, the, you can tell he's thinking intensely before he opens his eyes. There's just this intensity that, that just oozes from, from, from his body. He just radiates this intensity. And he's one of those, and, and so I, and I was extremely, pleased then to hear how how he got to where he is 
you know, he wanted to be a playwright and that, that didn't work out. And so he studies philosophy and he goes off to Cambridge or whatever, you know, and he, he takes a securitous route and ends up being a doctor, but only for a while. And then, and then he goes off and does this other thing. So I, I, I certainly appreciate that. And you can see how he's taken, wherever he's gone, he's always taken things with him to wherever it is that he's active. And, and that's, that's what enables we normal mortals to get a link onto what it is that he's actually saying. Because a lot of times he just starts talking and then I, got, I would get lost. But I knew if you wait long enough, he'll say something where, you know, another hook will come out. You can kind of like jump on and, and follow after that. You're extremely fascinating individual in that regard. And I'm, I'm not put off at all by his, his self-assuredness, you know. He never says, this is the way it is. He always says, I think I'm right. <laughs> and kind of throws down the, that gauntlet. And somebody has to prove me that I'm wrong. And other people just, you know, I guess that was the, the initial reaction between Horgan and, and Kaufman is Horgan told him, no, you're full of shit. And, 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 but, but he can take being told he's full of shit because his response is, but I think I'm right. And <laughs> you still, you know, you just thinking it's shit isn't really negating anything. You're just telling me, okay, you're not following this or I'm not explaining, whatever it might be. And so he, he pursues that. And I found, I found that, that side of him extremely, extremely endearing. And, and I can understand why he, he waited as long as he did. And I can also understand why once he sets out to do this, I mean, he did this in deference to his wife which is perfectly legitimate. But when he sets out to do this, little is going to deter him. He's not one of these people who's worried about, I don't think he was ever worried about his career. He's not one of those people who says, oh, I don't know, I might not get tenure. And it was just like, okay, then I won't get tenure. I'll do something, I will do something else. And I admire people who are willing to simply do something else if that's what they need to do. They're not, they're not their identity isn't wrapped up in whatever it is they happen to be doing at the time. Uh, which is what I find, you know, most careerists are like that. You know, if I don't do this, I don't know anything else. Well, you'd be surprised how much you know. Um, well, my, my life in Silicon Valley was like, I'm not an engineer. So, you know, living in an engineer's world as a non-engineer can be challenging at times. But I always knew, partly because a little voice kept telling me, that guy had to apply there. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry about it, it'll work out. You know, that kind of thing. So, you do get help if you're open to it. And, and, and Kaufman strikes me as the kind of person who's always open. He, he's literally always open to what's coming next. And so he's, he's uh, hard to follow in places, I, I agree. But I think it's most important with him, the details are simply the evidence that kind of supports whatever it is that he's saying. So it's easy to, to also get lost in the detail and say, well, I'm not following along with that, but just take, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with you for the moment. You're right. So what does that mean? Where does it lead us? And, you know, and I can, I can follow along there and backfill is necessary. That's why I also feel that, you know, um, Marco Massi and uh, uh, Jeffrey's get together next week will be helpful because they'll, they'll provide, I'm hoping some of that background in, for, for us normal mortals to, to, to take in that we can kind of piece together in some meaningful way. Because I, I do think uh, he's on to something. And we'll probably get back to this at the end because he made a few th statements at the end of the interview that I thought were just um, more than thought provoking. More than, we can come back to that later. Thank you. Yeah, I liked what he said about a transnational mythic structure and global ethics and they were experiencing these uh, cultural shocks right now. And the question he asked at the end of the video, and maybe we'll go into this later, is um, what can seven billion people create with one another? It's a pretty big, big question. Thank you. So th that um, speaks to the question of coherence, decoherence, and I don't understand the quantum mechanics of it, but I know that he's drawing on quantum mechanical uh, processes or phase states or um, other kinds of realities to um, make statements about or make descriptions about 
psychic level events, right? So the idea is that we can observe in the most fundamental systems that are observable at this time that uh, there's self-organizing activity, that a system will find coherence and that a system will go through phase states from coherence to decoherence to potentially recoherence. And that this happens at a level that's prior to life. It's prior to what tr classically is regarded as life, the biological uh, stress. So these are the building blocks, the quantum level, the atomic level, the cellular, molecular, molecular, cel cel cellular, cellular level. And I think part of the, one of the formal questions is how does, how do the patterns or the principles or the dynamics from one level or stratum, let's say of reality, get translated into to other ones? So if we observe the, the way that fundamental systems, material, you know, material systems, matter energy, self-organizes, appears to display vibratory life. Like it, it appears to display these, um, these unions of what from another perspective would appear to be contradictory states like stillness and motion. Uh, he described how one particle can be still and vibrating at the same time. To me, that reminds me of the silence of the cicadas. <laughs> There is that vroom, vroom, vroom vibration, which is this, let's say, I think it's a, a lower frequency, maybe, I don't know how many hertz if we were to measure it, uh, but it has a certain frequency. And then like, what if, I mean, what if I ask, just start extrapolating, free form, totally winging it, uh, what happens for that waveform to, to be canceled out? Is there something, like an interference pattern that occurs at the psychic level, whereby because of this interconnection, this uh, weird entangled state, which I'm not gonna pretend, you know, th this could be complete confab confabulation like that, I would grant. And I think that that's part of what Stuart holds in mind and he tests against that. But uh, is there potentially some way that my own mind, my reading experience, is interfering with the other waveforms that are uh, occurring in the in the phenomenon phenomenological moment in that in that space that we're the co the space of cohabitation between myself as human subject and the interiors of me that are pre-human or subhuman uh in just the sense that they're constitutive uh all the cells uh all the quantum uh particles in me that they're interfacing, interfering, uh, and sometimes perhaps amplifying with the environment. And so given like environmental conditions and intersubjective conditions amongst the agents in a system, what kind of amplifications or what kind of cancellations and uh, interference can, can be um, uh, can invoked or, or, or uh, conjured? Uh, um, engineered i don't know i mean this is where i think we get into the areas of where art and science really have to blend and so that's you know, just some initial thoughts on on this on these on on this dialogue uh and i'm glad that we have this opportunity to think about it before next week because then we'll be with the real physicists and um you know i'd, I'd like to at least be conversant with some of the language. And, and that's, I mean, sometimes it's just the language. Maybe it's not the mathematics that we have to understand. It's, it's the language. Well, well, I think that's fascinating, Marco. And, um, and I think there's something very galvanizing about physicists and non-physicists getting together with the intention to learn something from one another. And I think this transdisciplinary impulse, it's, it, you know, we're, we're, we're acting this out, we're embodying this. And I think it's really great that we can um, bring experts in one field and non-experts in, in that field and create some sort of exchange. And I thought what you said um, about uh, interference, amplification, I think um, Stuart Coven talks about constraints and other entities you may be interfering with them. That may be true. I know 
without a, without a doubt that other entities are interfering with me. <laughs> Every hour, I'll notice something that although my best intentions were at play, some other entity somehow fucked things up. <laughs> you know? And, and I, 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 I do believe that there are synchronistic events that I don't know that we, we create them. I think the human mind does, definitely has an impact and an influence. I don't know that we can say it's a causal influence um, because there are probably multiple influences and influencers in our, our, our daily arrange, living arrangements. And most of them are going to be non-cognitive and out of our awareness. Or otherwise, we would go absolutely start raving mad. <laughs> you know? It's a really good thing that I don't have to worry about what my pancreas and my liver are doing today. They're doing just fine without my awareness. So I think that is something that we're all going to be challenged by. Um, but I also think it, it, how much of the quantum, uh, we, you're talking about differences in scale and translation in between. But what happens when it scales up? So much of what they say, well, it doesn't really matter because, you know, this, this, this quantum interplays are happening at, a, at such a small scale that we would never even notice them and they don't have an influence. But I think um, the, the theorist that, uh, that, that's coming up next week that we're gonna look at, um, he wrote this book saying that he does believe that it scales up into our social reality. And that's the case he's making. And it may be very far-fetched, and there may be people who think he's out of his mind. But I think it's worth entertaining. Um, just as um, that, sh that short video of the man who um, created a visible object that was, uh, <clears throat> that was in between, um, that was vibrating and not vibrating at the same time. So I think these are, these are fascinating possibilities. So, but I do like the, what, what um, Stuart Collins says about constraints. It's uh, in the actual, there are constraints, just as we can make and share novel sentences that no one has ever said and no one has ever heard, but that are understandable to one another because we have the constraints of grammar. So syntax actually constrains us. So we, we don't have total freedom to do whatever we want. We have to constrain ourselves if we want to be uh, agents of, of mutual communications. So. I think that's really interesting. So thanks. Doug, anything coming up for you? So I, I will note that I picked up the Alexander Wendt book in May, and I've been attempting to read it off and on for the past few months and finally around uh, page 50 or 60. But he, he is very, he develops a coherent argument and um, he, he's clear to state that this is kind of thought uh, and philosophy and not science. And um, I think that's a good direction to go that hasn't quite been explored um, by others. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, hopefully, I don't know if I'll have time to finish the book, but no, it's really helping me tie in all the, the quantum experiments and how that plays into the, this big social experiment of seven billion people. That, that's the question that's asked at the end. Uh, like what, what can we do uh, if we work together um, or what can we create with one another? And I, I think that it, it is very helpful to have the professionals as you're saying and, and the non-professionals like us. And as we were talking about with the psychic um, and Ed, I'm reminded of Ed. Ed's as if. So I'm I'm coming into this. I, I'm I'm drawn to exploring these questions as if it's already true. Um, not that I'm going to do science experiments or even psychic experiments beyond my own personal whatevers. I'm not going to join a a club or anything like that. But um, so. Because I think I'm drawn to that because so much points in the direction that it's already as if this is true. Um, and whether or not it's exactly true or that it's going to, we're going to be able to go poof and 
an object appears in our hand that that's um not what concerns me but it, it is this larger experiment that's more grounded in in the earth that we have right now um and and more of the reality that that maybe timothy morton is getting at of of think it is a human focused endeavor that we have here but at the same time that there's going to be quantum everything everything has some sort of quantum level experience um and if it scales up to whatever degree that's great but it's good to take into account that that my water bottle has the same quantum processes going on as i do and yeah sorry i don't have much else to say i, I like what uh, has been said so far doug may i ask you had mentioned earlier connective tissue you just use the word connective tissue as the connection, the thing that allows the different levels or different states or objects to connect to, to each other. You hesitated a little bit when you said it. I'm curious what more you could say about connective tissue. So I think I was avoiding at that time, but connective tissue just automatically assumes there's some, um, it, it, for me at the time, it was going beyond metaphor, so I was trying to be more concrete uh, of just saying there's a connection going on. Um, there's not necessarily any tissue, but at the same time, um, I, I personally hold that belief that there, yeah, there's these, these webs or, um, I haven't read Deleuze or anything like that, but it speaks of the rhizomatic um, behavior that, that connects us all or, um, even someone like Michael Talbot and the holographic universe um, speaks of the psychological dimensions and and there's there's these dimensions that are connected somehow and whether it's waves or uh, particles colliding or whatever it might be um, so I hesitated because tissue just didn't seem right uh, and I'm very rough with words <laughs> at times I thought it was an evocative word, but I, I I wondered what, because I feel like there is a connective kind of tissue. Like, how is it that phenomena non-locally, uh, asynchronously can be coherent with each other? Uh, so, I mean, this is the question. I think, I believe this is what scientists look for. What is the quote unquote connective tissue? And I got an intuition like that, and it had something to do with you talking about grounding. Uh, and there, I have a book that's called You Are Psychic. <laughs> that's the name of the book. Uh, but I just flipped it open and I, I dip into it every once in a while. And one of the exercises that were suggested involved grounding to the center of the earth and allowing, releasing any kinds of obstructions, any kinds of um, negative energies, et cetera, like actually sending them into the center of the earth. <sighs> like, and... So I tried that and it seems to work it pretty well. And um, it suggests to me that like, when we talk about systems, we have to uh, include that psychic element, even though we may visualize it in particular ways, they're not, uh, you know, like as solid or as universal uh, because in this instruction, it's really whatever visualization allows the energy to move, allows the grounding to occur, whatever is right for you is what is what you should do. Uh, and so there's that element of personal influence and personal branding, for lack of another word, on, um, on what the exact details of the experience are, but there's something happening as a process, whatever we call it. And so, you know, the relationships between mind and world, between organism and environment, self and others, uh, seems to have this connective tissue whereby without there being direct physical interactions, there can be nonetheless subtle uh, and real in interactions. Like I can think of, I can have thoughts of a friend and this is very common, right? And then uh, I communicate with them and 
something has happened dramatic that you know they're, they're, that that justifies or makes sense of why I would be thinking of them and why I would reach out to them when there's no other physical triggers or indicators that I should do so. There's some that little voice. And so what is the medium? We know that if I speak my voice here, the medium is air. And the air allows the vibrations of the, you know, it allows the, uh, the vibrations of the, of the sound to actually reach the, a recipient. But what is it for the little voice that doesn't have that particular medium? What is that, what is that, um, you know, that psychic medium, I guess, you know, that, that connective tissue. I'm, uh, I, I feel like the, yeah, the physicists are trying to find it in the quantum realm. And I, I wonder, if, uh, anyway, I'm just hypothesizing, like you know, speculating about what, what's going on. Yeah, and I, I think those are going really, off of that real quick. Yeah, uh, what'd you say? Go ahead, Ed. No, I, I interrupted you. Uh, okay, then um, I just wanted to give another example of, yeah, and the direction you were going with, with the scientific exploration. I, I've had that recently with all the readings that I've been doing that the quantum isn't necessarily going to be the final realm or exploratory dimension. It, it's, it might tap into a new um, dimension of reality perhaps, but it, there's still going to be quite a bit more going on. And um, I just wanted to give the example of, of um, even something that has thousands of years of uh, historical application, like the chakra points or something like that, um, which some people can never experience. But um, th there's there's so many. I, I guess I'll briefly give my personal experience when I couldn't experience it, but I I imagine one day that there was this little being in my hand that was um, a shadowy figure of perhaps myself and I I saw the chakra points and I felt it in my body so as we're saying if we think about some, or as you were saying if we think about someone or something and we can feel it or or if you tap into the the point on your neck that's really sore and give it some sort of psychic thought but it's not necessarily thought and it's not necessarily like, yeah, there's, there's going to be a tough time giving definition to what that actually is. Um, but go ahead, Ed. Right at the beginning, the first statement that you had, you'd made, um, Marco, you had talked about bodies more than one, not just the physical body, but bodies. And, and if we just take, the word body, because it is a very nice descriptive term. Well, there's something that constitutes a body. And that, whatever it is that constitutes that, especially if I feel related to it, um, is in a sense some kind of tissue. You know, we don't, and, and I don't think, I'm sure that there's more beyond the quantum, but that's what we're hap we happen to be exploring right now. It took us a while to get there, and we're kind of in this, this I think Kaufman already broke through that in a, in a point. That was one of the things he said at the end. He goes, We're, it's not about probabilities. It's about possibilities. And that, that's, that's, a whole, that's a whole quantum state beyond whatever probabilities are. And, you know, and it opens up a whole lot. Um, I found it absolutely fascinating because uh, Kabbalah works with possibilities, not probabilities. It's, it's like a key notion that's in there. So, so what, what I think the quantum has done for us, it's made us more aware for anybody who engages it in any serious way. It's kind of made us aware of the fact we don't know where matter stops. We think of tissue as matter, probably. But we don't know where matter stops. We, we, don't, we don't know, you know, where, where does it just like become nothing? But it never becomes nothing because it's always there. And if it's just, and if it is in fact just that connection, but that connection is a connection. So it is in a sense, you know, I, I don't think tissue is a bad metaphor for that because it's one we can all kind of deal with. If we start taking it too literally, it'll probably get in our way. But as long as we're not, I think it's, I think it's very helpful. You know, I, I came to a lot of this um, through esoteric roots. 
so, and in, in esotericism, you know, you have a physical body and you have a, you have a, an etheric body and you have an astral body and you have a spiritual body or however they may, depending on who you're talking to, there might be four, there might be seven, there might be whatever. I don't think that part's important, but they are kind of talking about the same thing. And these are, in if we use Kaufman's term, these are coherences. There, there's something there that is that coherent and it stays relatively coherent even when it's being interfered with in some way. So to me, that it's, it's, a, help, it's a helpful way to, to think about these kinds of things. I remember a, a, I was working at Westinghouse in, um, in Mountain View on, uh, this is when I was in defense. And so we were working on the, we were going to take the peacekeeper missiles, which is an odd name for a missile, but we were going to take the peacekeeper missiles out of the silos in Wyoming because it turned out that was a bad place to put them because there's a lot of dampness, water, and moss that grows in, in big holes in the ground. <laughs> so when you put a, when you put this huge missile in there, it starts getting overgrown with moss faster than you can, than you can demoss it because you can't be throwing a lot of chemicals at it because you've placed a lot of chemicals in the containers there to have that thing go off. So they had problems and they decided, okay, well, we'll take it out. We'll take them out of the ground and we'll put them on rail cars and drive them around the country. And then the Russians will never be able to track where they are. And we'll have this, this, um, unbeatable defensive system. Well, well, it turns out um, the, missile, the missiles weigh 500,000 pounds. So when you put that on a rail car, it tends to sink into a rail bed and it doesn't go anywhere. And there was a, there's only one track in the United States that was built that could, could handle it. And so it had to be like somewhere along this straight line. That was, that was the only place that they could go. This is like, okay, we'll put them on rail cars. Like that's gonna help, but anyhow, well, I, the reason I bring this up is we, when you work in defense, you work in, it's kind of like being in a chicken, that's how I always describe it. It's like being in a chicken coop. Uh, everybody had his cubicle and the way Westinghouse was set up, we were a little team of six people. So we had three cubicles. Uh, there was an aisle that went down and at the end of the aisle was the desk with the, the, the section head. Our little team chief had his desk and then there were three cubicles behind that. So he, he being the lead had a double cubicle that was across the whole way and the rest of us just had these single cubicles. And we got a new project officer from Wyoming and she came down for a review. And so we would meet at the team meeting and you know just place a chair in the aisle between the cubicles and we could all kind of roll our chairs to the middle and we could, we could have a little conference there. And while we were there, she was sitting beyond the cubicles out in the hallway obstructing traffic. It's like, you know, everybody's going, I, I showered this morning. I don't know what, the, you know, why, why is she avoiding us? And, and finally, I just asked, I said, is there any reason why you're so far away? She goes, why do you folks all sit on top of one another? It, it was, she didn't have enough, she came from Wyoming and she, <laughs> she didn't have enough space. So, if, if we imagine a human being as being in some kind of, of, you know, the aura around this is some kind of egg-shaped structure, according to some, some upstairs. If we act as if that were true, then she needed more room for hers than the rest of us needed it for ours, because we lived in Silicon Valley where you're always around people. And you notice that as well when you go other places that have higher population densities. John, John knows the difference between living in New York and, and going to the Midwest, it can, be, it can be a shocking experience because all of a sudden, there's nothing constraining that egg that you're in. And it's, it's more than willing to go, oh boy, look at this. I got all this, I got all this room around, you know, that, I, that, you, can, that you can move to. Um, some country, uh, Germany has a, you know, the population density of our, uh, Germany is 10 times that of the United States. You know, we have, Montana has a million people in it, and for the same area in square miles, there's 82 million people in Germany in that same space. So you do adjust, you adjust these things, and then you realize there is something tissue-like about that because you can, you can feel when other people are in your space, whatever you happen to think your space is. And then you realize that in certain situations, I bring it in tighter, I let it out 
further, I have to adjust depending on whatever environment that I'm in. And I find I have always found it very helpful to simply, I imagine the egg, you know, or I imagine the body. I, and I personally have mine kind of shaped like mine because it's easier to remember. You know, it doesn't have to take on some, you know, some other kind of form. There's not, it's not like the, uh, the Marion uh, uh, the matrix or the <laughs> tendon that there's, that there's tetrahedrons inside of squares and octahedrons and these geometrical whatever, because I can't follow how many sides, edges or whatever it is, you know? So, <laughs> so I keep it simple, you know, for my simple mind. But, it's, but I understand what they're talking about when they say that in a sense, because it is analogous to these bodies that I think that I have anyhow that I actually believe I have. And I believe that I have gathered enough evidence and experience over um, uh, the past years where I've, you know, come to embrace that, that let's say that approach that I think it's, it's fair to say that it's a, the, the, that's a reality. And when you talk to others, even people who don't believe in that long enough, they've all had that sensation of having their space invaded because somebody's standing too close or being reticent or pulling or we, we notice those kinds of things and we describe them all the time. So let that, let it be the reality and just, and de deal with it there and, <laughs> and see, see how you come to terms with it. It might be very helpful at times. Wow. <clears throat> this is intense for me. Um, and uh, I don't know exactly how to approach this, but I'm just going to, I think there's a difference between speech acts. It's much more like playing soccer, what we're doing right now, than it is like reading or writing a complete sentence in our, in our notebook, you know? And I think there's, um, there's something, uh, the difference between a written word uh, that's communicating to us in our solitude, we have a book by ourselves, and the author may be living or may be dead, uh, but there's a communique that's happening. And this could be extremely intense, as we all know, as readers, we can be deeply moved or overwhelmed or shattered by a, by a really well-written piece of work, or our imagination to take off in, in, in all kinds of directions because of an inter interesting theory or meta theory we've read about. Um, but I think there's, but I don't think, in information theory, and even Shannon, who came up with the, the, that ratio between signal and noise in information theory, he said that's not what humans do when they communicate. It's not about eliminating noise. <laughs> that's, but it, it's not like we're sending, there's a, uh, we're sending information through a tube and uh, with some sort of code, and the, the receiver of that is, decodes it and sends us another message. I mean, that's probably what's happening more in certain communication systems like telephones and Shannon, that's what Shannon was working on is how, how can we get two people to hear each other over a telephone line? And, uh, and how do we make that possible? We have to eliminate a lot of noise. So, but I, I'm just saying this because uh, you mentioned uh, the cicadas and the silence of the cicadas and that silence erupted perhaps in coordination with your writing hand, okay? And as soon as you wrote that down, the sign, and in coordination with the thought process, the silence brought your attention to something that you would not have been attentive to if there hadn't been that coordination. And that is very interesting to me. And because what is the medium through which this kind, these kinds of communiques occur. Um, and I have had uh, more than my fair share of psychic experiences. Some of them, some of the most curious ones have to do with reading and writing and what's internal and what's external. And I've said this one before, it's, a, it's um, not a breakthrough moment for humanity, <laughs> but, but there was something very curious that let me know there's a backstage and an onstage, and we have some wiggle room. Something's going on between the backstage and the onstage. I had a dream. In the dream, I was hearing the song, The Impossible Dream, which comes from a musical, Man of La Mancha, um, based on Cervantes' novel, uh, Don Quixote. It's a very famous song. If you haven't heard it, you should find it on YouTube, because it's very catchy, too. 
So to dream the impossible dream, I woke up, I jotted it down, and I didn't jot it down in my journal. I just thought of it because I was late for work. That was what was weird. I got to work. I had to open the office. I turned off the, um, you know, I turned off the alarm. I turned on everyone's computer. I sat down at my desk, and I, you know, had a few minutes before people were going to arrive for work. So I opened up my notebook. And I remembered that I had the dream, and I remember in the dream, it was the impossible dream was being sung. And I wrote that down. I had a dream, and in the dream, I heard the, the, the musical, I heard the song, The Impossible Dream. And as soon as I finished that sentence, exactly, across the street, I heard a piano, and the piano was playing The Impossible Dream. And what makes me curious is there's a coordination of hands, digits, and thumbs. <laughs> I'm writing across the street. Another person is playing a piano. What is coordinating that activity? This is, we're both humans, but there's music and then there's writing. And writing is a different kind of logic than musical thought. Uh, musical notation does something differently than sentences and writing do. But there must be something underneath them that is holding together uh, something because this event happened, <laughs> which I do not consider myself a, ca a cause of any of this, but I certainly am a participant. And whatever is doing, whatever is making these events happen, I think is having a big, big belly laugh. <laughs> because it's just so fucking funny that these kinds of events, which have, I, I can't imagine that there's any useful purpose in any of this at all, <laughs> other than just, uh, you know, freaking me out. <laughs> it didn't actually freak me out, it delighted me. Because I thought, oh, wow, what a weird thing to happen. And, but then I started to think about it. And the more I thought about it, the weirder it becomes. Because this is way beyond just a coincidence. Um, whatever it is that's coordinating um, these kinds of... And then it gets even weirder when you're working with an entity that you're coordinated with that is not a member of your species, which has actually happened to me, too. Um, so anyway, it's, it's all very strange and it's getting stranger, I think. Um, but I don't think this is unimportant. And just to go back to uh, something that, um, we talking about Timothy Morton says, um, this is a big theory. Uh, he's talking about transcendence and how he believes, and the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That truism he believes is not true. He believes that the whole is different from the sum of the parts, but that the parts are not subsumed in this transcendence. And it's kind of weird to think about it, but he's claiming that the parts are, are actually bigger than the whole. Um, we have more influence than he, he believes than we do because we've been hooked into this Neolithic kind of uh, agricultural um, you know, fertility cult. We worship this God, which is transcending all of us. Um, and that um, it's, it's calling all the shots. So he's, a, I think, wonderfully speculating that that may not be so. And um, I like that idea, because then we're not just cogs in a big, cogs in a wheel in this big machine. Um, um, but, but that we may be, uh, if not causal, certainly influential in ways that we can't even begin to fathom. And boy, oh boy, do we need to learn how to be influential in a more effective way. Because I just heard, bad news, 79 degrees, the temperature 350 miles from the North Pole, that's bad news. <laughs> so more than ever, we have to sort of figure out what it is we want. And can we coordinate ourselves in ways that, that makes, uh, creates the conditions? 
because if we get too, like Timothy Morton says, if we, if we worry too hard and feel too guilty on a personal level for something that none of us are guilty for personally, um, we are going to just end up in a fetal position crying in the corner of our room, making ourselves totally ineffective because we, the polar bears and the dolphins cannot do this. We humans, we, we have to figure out how to do this. So I, but he says getting um, guilt ridden is not going to be useful at all. And I think that's true. I think our intuitive minds and our logical minds can coordinate much more effectively if we turn down the volume on the guilt and the blame. Uh, anyway, that's my sharing here. Thank you very much for this opportunity to rehearse this. Um, I want to say something, <laughs> but let's come back to the guilt. Uh, the, when you ask what coordinates, I think the tendency, not saying you and your tendency, but the tendency generally would be to posit another entity that has some overview of the various actors in the system and the dynamics between them and then orchestrates sort of causally, unidirectionally, and a result, an, an effect. And I think that that may be a holdover really from this um, theistic kind of idea, this transcendentalist you know, idea that there is an author who is separate, an observer or an author or an actor creator that is separate from the system and acts upon it, and isn't it him, herself, implicated in it? Uh, and so therefore, we're, all the participants in the system are determined by that uh, superior entity. Uh, whereas what I think I heard Kaufman arguing for saying is that the system itself is self-organized. The intelligence is in, in, imminent, inherent in in the system. And so there's no other to look to that is controlling everything. Uh, therefore, as the participants, I think like you're, like you're pointing us to, uh, uh, their, they have, they, their influence or their effect, um, I think is, can be powerful. And um, this is where, this is my edge, where I'm, where I'm emotionally, uh, you know, where I, where I emotionally get, get a little stuck. Hey, Michael. Hey, Michael, we've been waiting for you. <laughs> Did a lot of touch exercises today. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I just got some things going on. I just uh, pacing myself. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you, Marco. No, that's, that, that's cool. I'll, I, I, I'm sure I'll pick it up really quickly. <laughs> um, but the, the thing I thought was, um, Again, this is speaking as a non-scientist, non-physicist who's totally mangling all of this. But there was um, like you know, different ideas for what's going on with the entanglement and how is it that all these parts of the system are able to apparently communicate with each other across vast distances, vast times. And one proposed solution to that is that it's not, all, it's not actually multiple pieces. Uh, and the idea is there's only one, for example, one electron. And what we perceive as the you know, trillions and trillions of electrons are really aspects of that one electron. And so it's not from that vantage point, a great leap to figure out how these distinct electrons communicate to each other. They're always part of a single system. So uh, they're able to be uh, in coordination you know, without having a third entity to come in and coordinate them. Uh, and I think that that's interesting to, to even the local context, my backyard or your office or ed school or the intersection of the highway, wherever there may be some local context of interactions and influence and interference between different kind of coherent emanating wave patterns or bodies, uh, that's also part of a larger system. And, and you just keep going if you posit, whenever you posit another system, you, you have to see that it's, it's already pre-entangled with the one that you just uh, were assuming. 
So you end up in this, I think, very open kind of space where everything is happening all at once. Everything is entangled with everything else. And therefore we do, we can have profound influence if we can find that, I think, that point where stillness and vibration, I think that has something to do with it. Uh, and, oh, I don't know. There was something else I wanted to say, but uh, I'm, I'm blanking on it. Uh, so I'll let either, any of you uh, come in, but that, that's just what it, it, it triggered for me. And I do have to say that I will le need to leave before the top of the hour, probably 15 minutes before to make another meeting. Okay. Okay, we have about half an hour, so we'll be wrapping up soon. Because I wanted to get your personal, uh, what did we do? What do we call the beginning? Check in. We can check in at the end rather than at the beginning. I'm, I'm curious about if that's it, if there's a difference. But something I wanted to respond to briefly before I forget it, Marco. Um, something that I believe um, Timothy Morton is endorsing is that uh, our small groups are not meaningless. The United States, France. Germany, where are they? Point your finger to where they are. And I think this is also uh, where I think uh, Wint is going, that these are the United States, that because we are, my, our minds are, are using language, they are entangled. So the United States of America with the Constitution and the bylaws and the, 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 the executive branch and the judicial branch and how do they all work together and coordinate. Uh, all, this is all very, all these procedures have been activated and have been practiced over and over and over again. Um, but I think we're, we're holding it all together in a holographic kind of way. And I know this was shot down by a lot of people like Ken Wilbur says, absurd, but I think it's, we should revisit some of this. That, uh, especially since there's some, some theorists who are saying that these quantum, the quantum does scale up into our social worlds, like Vince is saying. So it may not be that far-fetched, um, but I think the good news is we don't have to wait for the United States and Congress and, the, uh, and a happy outcome of some election um, to have, a, 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 have an influence and a big influence. And uh, he says, ecologically, you need uh, for, for a, a group to form an ecological group, you need four, four people. If it's uh, less than that, it probably is not going to have the same impact as having at least four. I thought that was very curious. Um, so, um, so I think that we, we, we can have an influence. Obviously, we do have an influence. And... I believe that we can have an influence over the solar bear, the polar bears and the penguins and the dolphins, obviously, uh, because of our pollution. Um, but we don't have to sit in despair and do nothing at all, waiting for these big organizations which transcend us, maybe not include us, but they definitely transcend us, as if they're calling all the shots. And I think that, he says, is coming out of that a very theistic worldview, which is stamped on us, on all of us from a very early age, uh, that there are the bosses and they're the overlords and they call the shots. And I think he's trying to, you know, bring in the idea that we're, um, we're, we're giving ourselves post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, we may have a lot more freedom. That doesn't mean we don't have constraints. We have no freedom without constraints. We just need to work with these constraints the possible, the logics of the possible and the logics of the actual are not the same. The logic of the possible has no excluded middle. And I think that's really interesting <laughs> and very uh, uplifting when you think about it. A couple of things. It's interesting to know, John, how differently Morton is using the word, I'm only going on what you're saying because I'm not familiar with him how differently he's using the word transcendence than the folks that are writing in the uh, Axial Age book. That, this, that this, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts is, is, this, is the traditional or given or accepted def definition of synergy. 
It simply says it's more there than what you think is there. And I think that remains true regardless of how one goes about it. I, I would, that's a point where I would tend to differ. I understand what, I think I understand what he's trying to do to make us more aware of our partners, because without our partners, we can't get those four folks together. Um, I would have been surprised if he had chosen any number prior to four, because four points will get you three to make, it's a tetrahedron. So it gets you, it gets you spatially active. If you just have three, you're, you're still down at the triangle level, you're in flat land, uh, which is where most people think they are for the most part. I, I would agree. So um, one is only, Gapser says this as well, one is only as impotent as one thinks one is. And, if you, and those who believe that they have power only have it because they've been led to believe that they have it. Now, when I think about what's going on in Hong Kong, um, you know, the tanks haven't rolled out. Mainland China hasn't sent anybody down there to like quell the disturbance like they did in Tiananmen. I think I think they learned something in Tiananmen. They 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 they're and they are also they are on what what the Germans would call a, a tightrope walk. You, know, you can only do so much. You can only get on so much. This is something Trump doesn't understand. You know, he only understands ham fisted. Let's go, blame, aggress, whatever. You know, that, and because it's worked in the past, but people are getting more sensitized to that, and they're saying, well, why why do you have to do that? You know, I'm, it's. That, that's, that, that can't be the first and only re reaction to everything. You know, there has to be other ways to do it. And, and there's a lot of insistence going on that these other ways are taken in. So there are indications all over the place that, that even little groups like us, even though it's not perhaps directly influencing, but it's influencing because if we are sending, I'm, I'm going to put this in California terms since Michael's here with us. If we're sending out the vibes, then other people are going to pick up the vibes. I mean, it's all about vibes in the end. So, um, and I did learn that in California because it is all, it, it is vibes. Um, the thoughts that, that Marco has, and I, I, if the cicadas hadn't stopped when he circled hyperspace, I would have been surprised. I would have been surprised if somebody played the piano across the street, John, and it wasn't the impossible. That would have been the anomaly. That would have been the thing to go, oh, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this picture. Okay, that, that's where it goes askew as far as I'm concerned. That, that is the most logical conclusion to what had preceded it. And since you're on that trajectory, that's the one that you're going to, you're going to encounter. So it's, we do need to do these things and we do need to think about them in different ways. And we, do, and we have to do that continuously, that's, that's the thing. Uh, that's another thing that I got from from Kaufman. You can't you can't not do it. You can't let go. You can't say, okay, well, we'll, we'll coast to the next point or whatever that is, because this whole idea, the line that he, this is what I wanted to mention at the beginning, and it comes up here at the end, uh, that I wanted to bring in, is that he he made one statement that I just I wrote down. He said, evolution is building its own possibilities of what it will become, without selection which is the Darwinian side of that, achieving it. Evolution is building possibilities and doesn't give two shits. I'll use the, the I know that it bothers you, but in this context, we're like, uh, less so. But evolution doesn't give two shits about what natural selection thinks it needs. It's building possibilities, and any of those can be chosen. And any of those could be the one that we need, and any of those could be. And, so, and it's in this, the possibilities. and so. His, his breaking down of actuals, potentials, and possibilities is an extremely, that, that, that was the, the takeaway I had from the whole interview, was that that's Shima. Because the law of excluded, you know, the excluded middle does not apply to actuals, but it has zero impact on potentials or possibilities. And all of the power, you think it was in the potential, <laughs> is actually in the possibility because it's open to that. And any one of those, once it actualizes, this is the point, and he points this out, then the law of the excluded middle applies. But until that point, <laughs> it does not. And so we still have options. We still have other ways. Things can, can happen in ways that we don't 
we don't necessarily need to concretely envision them as long as we can open others and ourselves to these possibilities. Enough folks will start, they'll get the vibe. <laughs> Evolution will, will let us know what the vibe is and we'll go with it and the, there'll be the silence of the cicadas. It, it, that, that's, that stuff happens. I'm, you know, I, I felt this is one of those places where I usually go, okay, he's full of shit. But no, this is the part I go, well, he, he, he finally, you know, the rubber met the road right there. Yeah, yeah, I, I I agree, and I'm catching the vibe. I yeah. think. <laughs> and, and and before and before we hear from Michael, I just wanted to, Michael. I know you said that you had to leave early. Is there any um um uh, whatever? You uh, I'm to... reminded of a poem by Emily Dickinson. I'll recite it as my personal check out. I dwell in possibility, a fairer house than prose more numerous of windows, superior for doors, of chambers as the cedars, impregnable of eye, and for an everlasting roof, the gambrels of the sky, of visitors the fairest, for occupation this, the spreading wide my narrow hands to gather paradise. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Good to Thank see you, you Michael. Marco. Till next time. See you Till next time, time Marco. Bye bye. Oh, Take care. oh, uh, Michael, we're doing our, our check ins at the end rather than okay. at the beginning. Okay? okay, so if you got if you want to check in, check out, or something in between, I think this is a good time to do it, guys. And thanks, Ed. I have a I have some responses to that, but maybe I'll uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put that on hold and save it for the forum. Thanks. I think I'll chime in real quick if you don't mind. I, I will. I'll still be listening in if we go past the top of the hour, but I'll have to mosey on out. Um, as a way of uh, check-ins, I think I just simply wanted to say I appreciate the revival of uh, Gebser. That's been really useful for me as um, someone who just entered into the, the um, scene whatever that means, but I feel it's, it, there's so many connections. So I understand the, the desire to keep this guy around. Um, so that's very helpful for me. And yeah, I'm, uh, just a few questions and maybe I'll pass it on to Ed because I had a question about your bike a long time ago. You mentioned that you take your book reading while you bike. And I'm wondering if you're actually reading while you're on the bike or if you go somewhere to read. Okay, <laughs> just check, uh, because I, I know it's a, an electronic, pretty powerful bike there. It might have- I know, but I, I have to set a good example for the grandson, you know, no, you know, no texting while driving, no reading while biking. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's about all, I'm overall doing well. And um, yeah, I'll be, wondering how Gebser ties in with the quantum. So I know that was kind of uh, where he had his time left off there um, or his exploration. So it's yet another way to enter him into the scene. So great conversation. My, Michael, you want to chime in? Yeah. Uh... Um, I like what uh, I've been, uh, you know, hearing the last few minutes and um, bringing up California vibes. Um, speaking of vibe, just to chime in, one of the reasons, just to be open and honest, that I didn't is part of the vibe I was feeling is I needed to take a break. Uh, there's been a lot of things happening that I've been having to listen to within my uh, soul. Um, and so, uh, working with a sense of overwhelm, not just from this computer, but, um, my son moving and him not being around and close at hand and just a lot of personal stuff. And so I, I'm really, I, I feel really privileged to know you guys that the, the way I came on, uh, that was so welcoming and the topic was 
so relevant for <laughs> to why I was late and uh, was taking my time to come. It's not that I didn't want to be here, but I've been trying to really kind of fine tune how I walk with overwhelm sometimes. And because um, sometimes I kind of, um, it's just something I have to continually work with because of my history and that. Um, and, um, but one of the things about vibes, and maybe you guys were talking about this, um, there is this, um, there is this place of, to really vibe well, you have to have a, a kind of dynamic stillness I've been finding. It's not like you're set in concrete, but there's this quality of stillness that uh, that is dynamic. It's not uh, concrete <laughs> in a sense, you know? And um, the other thing I, I that popped in my brain when, uh, talking about the middle and the actual and stuff and the, and and the actual the middle kind of goes away but in a sense you're always left with the new middle the middle kind of i mean it collapses when it becomes actual but then you have a new uh, there's actually a new middle to me it's 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 it, it, it just comes up out at you sometimes if you're um if you're sensitive to it, I like what was talked about uh, about this liminal dreaming and the hypogotic place. That that language goes a lot better than when I was talking about daydreaming. Uh, that that phrasing of liminal dreaming and the hypogotic state is something I've been involved in for a long time. And I didn't recognize until I ran across, you know, how sometimes you run across an author or somebody's description, you're going, yeah, that's exactly what I've been doing. So I thank you guys. I appreciate it. I like, I like your, uh, your, your point there about that dynamic stillness. And it goes back to what Doug had said earlier about being grounded or rooted. A lot of times we think grounded means the, the charge goes away. No, it's just that it's that you don't go away. <laughs> you know, you, you don't get sent all over the Milky Way or whatever it is. Yet, yet we have to stay. Another, another word that we hear a lot of is rooted. Yeah, that, that also doesn't mean being stuck in one place. That just means mm -hmm. being connected in a way that doesn't allow you, or doesn't, or prohibits you, or or prevents you from being blown away or over overwhelmed that's another good word for it you know because we're yeah we are constantly challenged by that um you know john brings this up all the time we don't want another information dump which is the nice thing about the chat we had tonight there was very little information in that regard in there but there was a whole lot of interaction and engagement where we were seeing that we we use kind of different phrases and metaphors and whatnot to talk about things but we're kind of talking about the same things we even explored You'll see it if you, you look at the tape where, you know, Marco was questioning about connective tissue, which was a phrase, that, you know, that Doug had used. And mm -hmm. maybe that's not such a bad metaphor. Maybe we can use that for things. I, I find it helpful. Other, you know, he was struggling a little bit with it. So there was ways that we could share uh, with each other to, to see, okay, well, well how, how are we managing a lot of this overwhelmedness, you know? Because it's very easy to get overwhelmed with all of this. And you know, I've, I've had Wendt's book, he keeps popping up all over the place. And I'm considering seriously, that's going to be my plane book when I, we go on our trip. So, <laughs> that's good. You know, and so I'm not reading him by next week. You know, I'm not even yeah. going to open. I haven't even cracked the back of it yet. You know, I just got it and put it on the stack back here of to be reds, which keeps getting bigger. Um, I'll have to find another place to put it because it's an eyesore. But um, you know, I'll pull that out when, when necessary or when I, when I think it's, it's, you know, time for me to do that. Um, I, I also, and I, I didn't want to reinforce what Doug just said, I, in, enjoy, I am enjoying the fact that Gapes is being um, re-enlivened because we're finding, and I think I am at any rate, new ways to, to simply deal with, this, with this, the schema that he presents and the, you know, the, the, the way he approaches this so that we we have a shared vocabulary to a certain extent and we can, uh, you know, query and, and, and challenge 
um, all of those things, and find a way to to talk about things that otherwise are extremely difficult. You know, it's it's unfortunate in many regards that he died when he died because when you read part two, he he was really into this quantum stuff. He he really liked what was going on in physics. And, and it wasn't really very well developed at that time. A lot has happened since 1973. You know, just, you know, it's been quantum leaps since 1973. But we're, I appreciate the fact that he was, he's, he recognized it looks like it's pointing in that kind of a direction. And that's the direction that looks, you know, we're, we're going. So mm -hmm. he, for me, he keeps taking on ever more relevance because he did incipiently point towards, I think it's, it's going down there and it looks like that's where we are at the moment. So he's, he's a helpful guide in that, not to show us where to go, but to not lose faith that we're headed in the right direction kind of thing. It's one of those, you know, kind of an anchor point more than anything else. Were you going to say something, Doug? No, but uh, when you said anchor there, I, I was reminded when we were talking about grounding that another word is tethered. That, that's a good one. But um, no, that's all I wanted well, to say. And, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Oh, I was. This kind of ties into my post about lying on the earth. You know, instead of just walking on the earth, ly actually lying down. And I don't know if you guys remember, I shared a phenomenal experience about 10 years ago where I was laying on the earth and I fell into uh, a very deep altered state of actually being so one with the earth and actually from a feeling seeing of how the earth is supported by what appears to be nothing. It's there. Uh, and, you know, after the fact, I knew that part of that is the gravitation of the sun that's supporting it, that's unseen. But the felt experience of visualizing and feeling something that I can't see, you know, or actually, in a certain way, there there's feeling, but it's so it's so subtle that sometimes you don't know what to do with it because you know our feelings. Sometimes uh, we have to work at. Um, in my case, I just think being using a certain rigid carefulness of, well, what meaning do I assign the feelings that show up, uh, you know, actually feel into them before that mental rational tries to sort them out. And so laying on the earth, um, actually, when I posted that, that's actually what I did to help myself. But so I'm glad to hear that this conver uh, how this conversation uh, see, I, I can't wait to see it because it's it's really relevant for all of us uh, in these small groups doing what I for my hippie days just a grassroots uh, change that is I feel is taking place and it's very relevant in the sense that I've had opportunities to interact with people in such a different way and they and I mean situations that are tense where 10 years ago I would have been over the top reacting where I'm still I still have my edge of I'm going to deal with this and you're going to know it but I it, it's a skillful discipline of saying no to somebody that's behaving in a certain way that I seen towards another homeless person but I dealt with it, let it go. I, I just like where I'm at of, of not, diseng not the extremes of disengaging or getting too involved of what's needed right now, really being sensitive to that. So thank you. Thank you. And um, I guess my, um, I had a dream last night. I wrote it down. I am on a bus with Beatrice. She was the lady I took care of. She died maybe two, two, three years ago. And I took care of her the last five years of her life. She was 90, she was 94 when she died. And I was with her. I was the only person who was with her when she died. Anyway, in this dream, we we're curled up in our seats on this bus and we were having an animated conversation, which, uh, B could not do when she was alive. 
because she had a aphasia and she was had severe dementia. Uh, so she could never create a smooth sentence. But in this bus, in this dream, she was talking a mile a minute, very animated. She's making sense and she's very charming. I joke with her that she should wear sunglasses and a long scarf. It would make her look like a movie star. And I noticed a bus driver who's just a few seats ahead of us is making signs on the window. And then I have another, and then I have another section of a dream. I remember I'm in a conference given in an L-shaped room. I'm going to make a presentation and the name of it is Poetry and Mind. And the man who's running this conference is very supportive of me. So those are the dreams that I had. There were other ones that I can't remember very well, but I think there's, if there's something that I, I, I got from Timothy Morton, this philosopher, ecologist, he says, small entities can do a lot. He said, if the, if the farmers would let 10% of their fields go fallow, it could change the Mississippi River dramatically. If, if, if you're a meat eater, if you would eat a little bit less meat, you would have enormous impacts on the, on the ecology. So don't let them tell you, you don't matter. You do matter. And it, if we could coordinate our efforts, I believe people are trying to do this all over the, all over the globe. And, you know, if you just, if you can remember a dream and write it down, you may be coordinating non-cognitively all kinds of intelligent entities who are like, oh, this guy, he's paying attention. Let's get him something to work on. <laughs> and I'm not talking in a top-down kind of fashion. I'm talking about, or bottoms up. We're, we're, we're top down and we're bottoms up. And we move laterally all over the place. So I'm just uh, saying um, that I had this, this dream about Beatrice and that she was beautiful and talking a mile a minute and very happy. <laughs> that just makes me feel so good. <laughs> you know? And I just wanna share that because I believe that we're, uh, what utility, what's the social utility in missing someone that's dead, you know? That's an absurd way of phrasing it. Um, because we all know the people that die, we still love them. And you know, or people we break up with, we still love them, even though we may not speak with them, they may be, may be living um, across the street from us, who knows? But I'm just saying that um, these little bitty acts of kindness and of love, or even our, using our memories in a very subtle, in, in very subtle ways, um, doing these little sensory motor exercises that we did. And I hope you'll get a chance to look at the, at the video. Um, I will. Michael, I, will. Because I, I was intentionally wanting to work with touch. touch uh, I, I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to see it. But, but I think these, and the little, and the poems that we write and um, the books that we read together, I believe that we're, we're, uh, the field is being influenced and the field is influencing us. It's a, it's a, it's a two way communique. So thank you for this opportunity to share at this level today. I think it was very, I learned a lot and it's very surprising. How we were able to work with ambiguity. I think it's great <laughs> that we can, rather than freak out over it, we can just say, okay, well, let's work with this somehow. Um, because I think that's where, I think that maybe the ambiguity is coming from our futures. And uh, how we work with that is going to be very, very important. Thanks. Very true. <laughs> You mentioned uh, Professor Morton needing uh, two ambiguities. So I, I hope we can uh, find that second one here <laughs> or, or the next time. I think we've had lots of ambiguities delivered here today. Thanks. Thanks everyone. I'm out of here. Thank you. Glad you showed up, Michael. Uh, yeah, Doug, good to see you. <laughs> Hear your voice. Thank you all. Okay, thanks uh, a lot, guys. See, see you guys later. Time. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.